Hello again, I am Blunty and we are about to build a pretty badass gaming PC rig here. One specifically to suit the rather aggressive needs of someone who does a lot of YouTubing or streaming and things like that. But I'm going to lead you through the build process in a fairly hardware agnostic way because regardless of whether you're dealing with sort of high-end gear or middle-end gear or low-end gear, it all goes together in much the same way and the build process is more or less identical. So even though I am using the fancy stuff, you can use this video as a beginner's guide to putting together your very first custom-built gaming PC that suits your needs exactly and you won't believe the, the swell of, 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 of smug self-satisfaction you get once you finish one of these things and start gaming on it and everything works perfectly. Feels really good. The Surgeon General warns that building custom gaming PCs may become addictive. Parental guidance is recommended. It's intimidating, I know. All these little bits and pieces and components, it's all very confusing and baffling for a first timer, but I'm here to tell you, it is actually way easier than it looks just from staring at a pile of components. It goes together really easily. Most of the stuff, you can only even plug in correctly one way around, so you'd have to really try hard to screw something up so badly that you ruin anything. In fact, it's so easy, you only even need two tools. Well, one tool, really, if you don't care about keeping your cables tidy. First one is Phillips head screwdriver. Second one is a pair of snips or needle nose pliers, preferably both, really. Snips to cut off the ragged ends of the cable ties and needle nose pliers in case you need to get into the sort of bits you can't really reach that well. Well, I guess it depends on how big and fat your hands are. So, all right, let's step you through the various components that I've chosen here. If you don't care about the particular components I'm working with, or you are familiar with what the components are and what they do, there is a time index up on your screen right now you can skip to to go directly to the build process. So, your basic components are the CPU, the brain of the PC, and the one I'm using here is the AMD Threadripper 1950X. It's bigger than most CPUs, but they all look more or less the same. There's also the CPU cooler, which is pretty self-explanatory. These come in two main types. Air coolers, which consist of a heatsink, which is an array of metal fins designed to pull heat away from the CPU's surface, and a fan, which blows through the fins to let air flow through it and carry the heat away from it. There's also water cooling, which comes in various forms, but the easiest for newbies to deal with is the AIO, or all-in-one. These consist of a metal plate, or CPU block, which connects to the CPU, and a radiator. Water is pumped through tiny channels inside the CPU block. The water absorbs the heat from the CPU, then flows into the radiator, which fans blow through to cool the water down again. And on and on the cycle goes. It's all a completely closed and self-contained system. They can sometimes be slightly more awkward to install than a regular air cooler, but they are very efficient at heat transfer, and they're usually quieter than an air cooler. The one I'm using here is a Cooler Master Master Liquid 240 All-in-One Water Cooler, a simple and subtle twin fan cooler which has a very quiet pump, so it should be virtually silent. Pretty important if you are recording or streaming while you're gaming. Next up, the motherboard, which is what everything connects to, and which lets all the parts talk to all the other parts. I'm using an MSI X399 Gaming Pro Carbon AC, which for those interested I will be taking a closer look at in its own video review, but for now, suffice to say, it's a very, very fancy motherboard. But all motherboards have a very similar layout. The CPU socket, whose installation procedure will vary depending on the CPU. This Threadripper one is called the TR4 socket. Its installation method is a little bit different than most other CPU sockets. There's the memory slots where the RAM is installed, PCIe slots where we'll be installing the graphics card and a couple of other expansion cards. There's the main power input for the motherboard and special ones just for the CPU, sockets for the cables for your storage drives, a series of connectors for things like cooling fans, the audio inputs and USB sockets on the front of most cases. It's best to consult your manual as you build to make sure you're plugging everything in where it needs to be because the location of these various plugs can vary a little bit between boards. The next component is the memory sticks. There are a couple of different types, but once you choose your CPU, you can then choose an appropriate motherboard and then you will know which memory you need. These are DDR4 sticks. The graphics card is an obvious essential component for a gaming PC. No prizes for guessing what this is for. The one I'm using here is the MSI GTX 1080 Gaming X Plus, an extremely good example of the GTX 1080 from Nvidia. 
Storage drives next. For this build, I am using a few solid state drives from Kingston, the HyperX Savage, a smaller one just for Windows, a larger one dedicated to game installs, and another one for general use. I'm also using two very large mechanical Seagate drives for mass storage, a 6TB one for mass file storage, and a 10TB one dedicated to video files from my cameras and gameplay recording sessions. However, a single SSD and a single larger mass storage drive is usually enough for normal PC use and is easily the most common arrangement in builds. Then we have the power supply and the case. For these, I'm using an Enermax Platimax 1350 watt 80 plus platinum power supply. Brutal overkill, I know. Isn't it glorious? Most builds won't need more than a 600 watt unit, and you'll find power supplies usually marked with an 80 plus bronze, 80 plus silver, 80 plus gold, or platinum, which refers to how efficient the electronics are, platinum being the best. Regardless of capacity and efficiency, the power supply unit for PCs is more or less a standard modular thing. They're all installed and plugged in, basically identical. And finally, the case. This is the Mastercase Maker 5 MSI Dragon Edition from Cooler Master. Different cases will have different features, like how many drives they can have mounting places for, and which drive sizes they accommodate, and what size water cooling radiators they'll fit, and motherboards also come in three common sizes, from biggest to smallest, ATX, Micro ATX, and Mini ITX, so just make sure that the case you want is designed to mount the motherboard that you've chosen. Aside from those differences, the mounting on motherboards is all standard. Now, the assembly. It'll take a newbie from one to three hours, depending on the case and how many components you're using, and of course, how good the manual is. But take your time. There's no need to rush anything. Nothing you're doing is time sensitive, so just work slowly and carefully. Firstly, you'll unpack the motherboard. Rest it on top of its box while you install the CPU. Again, the method of doing so will vary depending on which CPU you've chosen, so check your manual. You can also install the RAM at this point. You may have two, or four, or even up to eight sticks of RAM, depending on your motherboard and configuration. Two sticks of RAM is the most common. Your motherboard manual will tell you which of the two RAM slots you should use for this arrangement. And it is important to get that right. RAM only goes in correctly one way. There's a little locating notch at the bottom. Press the stick down evenly with moderate pressure till the latches click into place. At this point, it's usually a good idea to check your cooler's mounting arrangement. Some coolers will need a special supportive backplate to be mounted on the motherboard, or additional supports on the front, or sometimes both. It's usually easiest though to save mounting the cooler itself until the motherboard is mounted inside the case. This will make it easier for you to maneuver the motherboard and to install the mounting screws. And that said, now it's time for that. Check your case's manual. Some cases are good to go. Some will need you to install little screw standoffs in the appropriate place to support your particular size of motherboard. That checked, now install the I.O. backplate into the case. This will have come with your motherboard to accommodate its particular arrangement of ports and plugs on the back. Carefully and gently lower the motherboard into place over the screw posts. These standoff posts are to keep the electronics on the motherboard from shorting out on the metal interior of most cases, so make sure it is positioned correctly. And be careful to align them properly. You don't want these things sliding over or scratching the back of your motherboard while you're trying to position it. Now, it's just a matter of installing several screws into the various mounting holes to secure the motherboard in place. Only moderate pressure is required. Don't go nuts tightening these screws within an inch of their life. So long as the board doesn't rattle around, you're golden. The sequence of installing the rest of the components isn't vital. Different cases will make the order of installation easier some ways than others. I usually go for the power supply next, as it's easier to connect the CPU power now than when there's a bunch of other things in the way. Like, for example, the cooler. There's a long connector for the main power on the board, and one or two smaller ones for the CPU-specific power. This, like your CPU mount, will depend on the kind of motherboard you're using. But like most everything, it only plugs in correctly one way. You can't screw this up unless you're really, really very determined to jam something in where it clearly doesn't want to fit. Once that's done, follow the mounting instructions for your cooler. They're all fairly similar, but all are just a little bit different. Some are simple, some are a bit fiddly, go slow, Check your manual and be patient. For this all-in-one that I'm using, I'm mounting the radiator and fans to the case first and then installing the water block on the CPU. Now you want to actually connect the cooler to the motherboard so the computer knows when it needs to spin up the fans in response to extra heat generated when it's working hard. 
For an air cooler, this will usually be just one socket that will go into a CPU fan plug on the motherboard, the location of which is usually, but not always, just above the CPU socket. Check your motherboard manual. For an all-in-one cooler, most motherboards these days have a special connector for the pump. It's the same connector as the one for the fan, but the computer treats it a bit differently because it's controlling the pump speed and not fan speed. So it is important to make sure you're plugging this in in the right spot. And once more, these plugs and sockets are arranged so you cannot possibly plug them in incorrectly. They only fit one way around. You'll also now need to connect the radiator fans to similar fan headers on the motherboard. Usually these will go into the one marked for the CPU fan. The next easiest thing to do before things get too cluttered in here is connect the front panel stuff. This is usually the power switch and light, the reset button, the hard drive activity light, the front panel USB and front panel audio jacks. These are almost always a pain in the bum. They're very small connectors that mount to little pins on the motherboard, and if you do have big hands like mine, you may want to get some needle nose pliers or blunt end tweezers to help you out here. Follow the markings on the plugs and the pin locations listed on your motherboard manual. And try to be calm. This is where, quite frankly, I almost always lose my temper just a little bit. It's so fiddly. Frankly, it may be the hardest thing about this whole procedure. Which is good news, really, because it's not that hard. Just, just fiddly. And as you're connecting up these various pump and fan and front panel connectors, you should also think about cable routing. It's not essential, but it is nice to try and keep things tidy, especially with a windowed case. It's also best practice for the sake of airflow not to have cables hanging everywhere. Although in practical terms, really, it doesn't make a world of difference. You can hide some of the cable clutter directly under the motherboard. Many cases have little spots for hooking through cable ties to keep things in place. And most cases have little holes here and there so you can thread cables behind the main mounting plate. Front panel audio will be on a separate connector. It usually hooks up near the bottom and back of the motherboard. Once more, the motherboard manual is your guide to this one. And now might be the easiest time to also hook the case fans up and manage that cable run too. Next, we can install the drives. Start by locating the mounting points in your case you want to use. Every case is a bit different here, so you know which book to look through, right? Install all of your drives into whatever mount suits you best. You can now hook up the power and data cables, called SATA cables. And of course, once more, these ones only plug in one way correctly, so you can't mess this up. The other end will go into the ports almost always on the front edge of the motherboard. It doesn't matter so much which drive plugs into which socket, so don't sweat that too much. Well, frankly, it can sometimes matter, but by the time you're putting a system together complex enough for that to be a factor, you'll know what to do anyway, so honestly, don't worry about it at this stage. The power cables for your drives will usually have more than one power socket on each run of the cable. If the spacing and arrangement fits, it's perfectly okay just to use the one cable. More than enough juice in one of these things to run a few drives easily. At this point, believe it or not, you're actually nearly done. What remains is the graphics card, left to last because obviously it'll just be in the way of all these little cable hookups otherwise. First up, remove the appropriate little gap filler guys on the back of your case to make room for the GPU's back panel. Make sure the little latch on the PCI slot is open, then carefully slide the GPU into place in the slot. The edge with the back panel first, then evenly push down across the graphics card until the locking latch on the PCIe slot snaps shut. Now, if necessary, hook up the auxiliary power to the graphics card. And again, this can vary between cards. Some don't need any, some use only a 6-pin connector, some use a 6 and an 8. The most powerful cards often require two sets of 8-pin connectors. Whatever the case, all power supply units have an appropriate arrangement for whatever graphics card you're using, and once again, you cannot really mess this up. It's all keyed and latched to only go in correctly one way. Now, the build is done. Unless, of course, you wanted to do more fancy stuff, like thread through some lighting and things like that. But the job now is the tidy up. A bit of cable management, cable ties here and there to keep things secure and tidy. Again, optional, but recommended if you want to take some pride in your work. And speaking personally, I find it quite satisfying to have a nice clean cable run. You can now pop the case panels on, hook up the power, a keyboard, a mouse, a monitor, and press the power button. If all has gone to plan, stuff will light up, which mine has. The next thing that's going to happen is it'll power on self-test or post. Or post. Please post. Hey! The monitor's powering up, which means it's getting signal from the video card and... Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, give it to me. What did I tell you about the, the smug? You know, the smugness and the self-satisfaction. 
Boom! Alright, it's not going to do anything because there's no Windows installed. That's the next step. So the next step is installing Windows and all your software and bits and pieces, which is outside the scope of this particular guy. This was just about getting the hardware done. So if unsuccessful, if nothing lights up, if nothing hums to life, if no fans spin, no lights come on, anything like that, the first thing you want to check is the power switch on the uh, power supply unit, the PSU. Believe it or not, that's one of the most common things to go wrong when you build a new computer. You've tried to flick the switch and nothing happens. You usually have forgotten to turn that switch on. It happens to the best of us. If you've done that, things light up, but the thing still doesn't post or it doesn't boot up properly. Your next stage of problem solving is to check all your connections. Check all your power connections first, the big 20 pin connector on the motherboard, the ones for the CPU. Make sure the RAM is seated properly. Make sure the uh, graphics card is seated properly. Double check all your little plugs and connections of the fans and the front panel headers and stuff. That's the other common thing. You have those little fiddly front panel headers. Sometimes you can just, I mean, this is so fiddly. You can just pop those in the wrong way around or on the wrong posts and things like that. Uh, I've done it a few times where you know, the power button wasn't hooked up to where the power button should have done. Don't panic if you've done that. There is no possible way you can do any damage if you just put those little connectors around in the wrong way. The chances are, in fact, very high that you're now ready to go and you're feeling that that swell of self-satisfaction, that that smugness come across your face. So let me know how you go. If, uh, if you are about to embark on your very first PC build and this video has been helpful or whatnot, do drop a comment down below. If you're a bit of a know-it-all expert and there's something important you feel like I've forgotten that deserves mentioning or some little detail that newbies might want to uh, know that I said oh, I didn't think of because I've been building this so long it just didn't occur to me to mention it, drop a comment in the down below area. But to be frank with you, I am feeling very confident that I've taught you enough for you to be feeling very confident about building your own PC. Enjoy. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I'll catch you next time. Beat it up first try. <sighs> Bit of a relief. <laughs>